turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27. I like that song, Our God Never Changed. In case you don't know, Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we serve a risen Savior, excited about what he has for us in 2019. Uh, so the book of Ephesians, if you do not have a Bible, I would encourage you that we give free Bibles away at our Welcome Center out there. Uh, the New King James Version of the Bible got some different colors on the outside. And so if you are here this morning and you are what I call Bibleists, don't worry, don't fret, go ahead and just get a free gift from us, and that is yours to keep. We want you to have the scriptures. We want you to have God's Word. I want you to be able to follow along. A couple reasons why we give Bibles away. Number one, the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we want people to be saved, and that comes from the scripture. Another reason we give Bibles away is that's how we grow as Christians. The Bible says in the book of Peter, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that we may grow thereby. So not only after you get saved, man, I want us to grow in Jesus Christ. Another reason we give Bibles away is this. I need you to know that the things we preach from this pulpit and the things we teach are not things that I make up. They are from the scriptures, and so I encourage you, go ahead while I'm talking, get up right now, grab a Bible, and we are going to be in the book of Ephesians for our study this morning. And so while I pray, go grab one, and if you don't know where the book of Ephesians is, just look at someone who's already there and ask them to find it for you. They'd be more than glad to help. Let's pray and then dive in. Father, we thank you for the chance we have to come to sing about our Savior, to study his word, to praise his name. And Lord, as we come upon a, a new year is upon us, Lord, I am glad that no matter what difficulties, challenges, or, or things that come our way, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That you're always God, you're always there, and you know what this year has before us. And so, Father, as we approach 2019, I ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning, challenge us to live a life this year that is pleasing to you. If there's someone here that does not know Jesus as Savior, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit of God will begin to work in their heart and their life to see their need of salvation that is found in Christ alone. So I pray that you would bless as we come to your word. Give me the right words to speak, Lord, and pray you give the people the ears to hear. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, we're starting in verse 27, entitled this, What to Be in 2019. At the start of every year, I've been doing this for over 20 years, I make a list of things that I want to do for the upcoming year. I make a list of all the things I want to accomplish in my life and things I want to accomplish in my ministry. And I think having goals is important. Goals for me, writing things down for me, it keeps me motivated to try new things. It helps me not to fall into a rut when it comes to ministry in my life. Goals keep me task-focused. I write down the goals I write in the order I want to do them, how I want to do them, when I get them done. And so for me, I like lists, like I asked. Anyone else a list maker? All right, great. There's some blessings and some burdens with being a list maker. The blessing is we write things down and we get things done. The burden is we drive everyone else crazy with our lists who are not list makers. And so if you are married to a list maker and you're not a list maker, good luck, God bless, hope it all works out. I know we can drive you nuts. So we make our lists, we write our lists, and then we do our lists. And, and so I fall into that category. I make lists every morning I come into work. I make a list of things I want to do and the order I want to do them and what time I want to have them done. The challenging is sometimes my lists don't go the way I want. And God has different plans for my list. So when I thought, okay, what sermon will I bring for the first sermon in 2019? I thought, I'll bring a list. I'll come with a list, because I'm a list maker. And I'm going to make a list of all the things that God wants, I believe God wants us to do at Temple in 2019. So I started writing my sermon. List number one, I want to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. But like always, God decides, you know, my list ain't always his list. And as I went to bed on New Year's Day, just all of a sudden, you know, God just spoke to my heart about this. And and he kind of changed the sermon a little bit. He said, you know, instead of making a list of things you want to do, what I want you to do is I want to preach a message on things that I want you to be. Instead of writing a list, Joe, of all these things you want to do this, you do this and do this, the first sermon needs to be not what you're going to do. The first sermon needs to be what are you going to be. And so as I wrote this out and I prayed about it, I found that, that there were several things, you know, what God wants us to be in 2019. 
If I asked you what do you want to be, I would get a lot of different answers from a lot of different people. Some of you would just say, 2019, I want to be rich. I, I want to be rich. Anyone else could use a couple extra mil? All uh, right, yeah, yeah, you know, that, would that not fix most of your problems, all your problems, and this problem, that problem? Yeah, don't worry, Pastor Joe, I'll play the lottery, I'll tithe off it, you know, whatever, whatever works for you, but, yo, know, some people just want to be rich in 2019. Some people just want to be happy. Man, I just need, you know, I just want to be happy, I want things to go good, I, I want things to, to work in my life. Some people just want to be married. I need a man, Pastor Joe, can you find me a guy or something? I need a woman. Can you find, hook me up with someone? Then there's some people who are married going, I need to be single, man. I need to get rid of this person. <laughs> They're killing me in 2018. I don't want to be dragging them around with me in 2019, too. And some people want to be liked. You want to fit in with the kids at school, the students in college, or the people at your work. And some people want to be successful. And, man, I want things to go perfectly for me. I want things that I do to grow and, and just kind of move up the ladder of success. I think more and more people want to be looked at. I want people to notice me. I'm going to act this way. I'm going to dress this way. I want to draw attention to myself. And, and there's nothing, you know, some of those things are good. Some of those things may, may not be so hot. But, but here's the problem. As I looked at all those things that, that people want to be, I could not find anything, any of those in Scripture. I couldn't find where God says, I want you to be rich, though that would be nice. I can't even find something where God says, I want you to be liked. Definitely doesn't say, I want you to be looked at. And and even though it's good to be successful, and, and, and it doesn't even say God wants us to be happy. And as I studied the scripture, you know, I looked at all those things that, that people want to be, but what kept coming back to me is this, God, what do you want me to be? What does your scripture say I'm to be? What do you want for me? What do you want for you? What do you want our church to be in 2019? And so it's my prayer that God would work first in my life, and then that God would work in your life, and that God would work in our church for us to be a people that God wants us to be in this upcoming new year. And I think as we look at what God wants us to be, it'll help us to do what God wants us to do also. I think God cares about what we are first, and then focus on what he needs us to do. And so five things God wants us to be in 2019, all found in the book of Ephesians. They start off kind of hard, and they get a little bit easier, I think. The first one is this, and if you'd like to fill in the outline, it's on the back of your bulletin. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, the first thing that God wants us to be as people and as a church is God wants us to be holy. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, we read this, that he, speaking of Jesus, might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. God desires, first of all, for me, for you, and for his church, his people, he desires for us to be a holy people. The scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, but he who has called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So because we serve a holy God, God wants you and me and his children to also be holy. Now, I know none of us are going to be perfect. I know we still have a sin nature. I know the scripture teaches us that we will not be fully perfect and fully holy until we are in heaven with the Lord. So I get it. We're never going to achieve it down here. But God says, listen, while you're here on earth, though, while you're working things out here, what I desire for my people is for my people to live holy lives. There might be some stuff in your life that just needs to go. Maybe you've had some things in your life that you know God does not want, and you have been dragging them through year after year, and they've been plaguing you. You had this sin that you just kind of keep. You had it in 2015, you keep rolling with it in 16, you kept it in 17, and you kept it in 2018, and now we're about to enter a new year. And what God is saying, listen, just because you have been doing some activities, some sinful things in the past, that doesn't mean you need to bring them into the new year with you. God has a new year. It is a fresh start. And one of the things that he desires for his people is to be holy, to live a life that is pleasing to him. Sometimes this is what happens with our sins. Our sins hold us down, they keep us back, they hinder our relationship with God. 
And what God wants us to be, he says right here, for his church, he goes, I want you to be holy. We can have a Baptist temple. We can start all the newest programs. Have the best kids program, have the best team programs, have the best music. We can do all of our programs, and we can have all of them just right. Small groups, this group, that group. We can sing all the best songs. I can try to bring all the best new messages. But listen, I I believe this with all my heart. We can get all the programs right. We can get all the songs right. I can do all the messages right. But if all we're focusing on the outside and we're not looking at the inside, then something is wrong. God's desire is for us to make sure that the inside is right. That we as a church and as his bride of Christ and as his children, that we are putting away things that we know are wrong in our life and start to live a holy life that's pleasing to him. Jesus said it this way about making sure the inside's right. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said it like this. He said, first, clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of it may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Listen, there's one thing we all agree. We all want clean cups, right? And we all want the cups especially to be clean where? On the inside. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to share with you the most disgusting thing that ever happened to me. Just kill the Facebook feed now, man. <laughs> Back in the day, you know, we were uh, hanging out with a group of people, and we were just, you know, had different Coke cans, and, and anyone, Orange Crush, anyone Orange Crush fans, you like, you know, you know. and so, you know, pe- we, they bought a case of Orange Crush, and we were drinking it, and, and people were, you know, looking around, and all of a sudden, you ever just see a bunch of cans, and you forget which one's yours? Yeah, I forgot what one's mine. And so I'm drinking the can, I'm like, you know, it tastes a little funny, but hey, it's mine, it's mine, and, and I get to the end of the can, and you know what I discovered was in it? You think it's, no, it was someone's fingernails. <laughs> See, I knew I shouldn't have told you. I know, I know. That's worse than cigarette butts, wasn't it? And I had, is anyone about to gag? <laughs> it's like a reflux, man. I'm like about to puke right here. And I was like 16 years old. I still remember it to this day. And I just went, chick, 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 and I'm like, oh. The outside, you know, it looked all right. It was orange crust, but the inside had some dude's fingernails in it. (laughs) You know what I discovered after that day? Number one, if you don't know it's yours, don't drink it. (laughs) Number two, check the inside of the cup. You go into a restaurant, what do you all do first? You're like, anything floating around? Yeah, you check the inside of the cup. So I want the outside to be clean too, by the way, but we know what's more important than the outside? It's what's on the inside, right? And so what Jesus is teaching here is simply this. Yeah, the outside may look good, but what's the most important thing is what is taking place on the inside for us as Christians and as his church. What God wants for me and what God wants for you and what God wants for us for a church is, yes, to have goals and to have things and to have programs, those things that he blesses, he uses. I love singing praise. I love our ministries. But beyond all of those things that God has us to do, I tell you what, what God wants us to be is a holy people. And the reason he wants us to be holy is because he is. And he wants us to be like him. And so it's my desire and your desire, it should be to to, to get our lives right with God. And if you would examine your life this morning, and you would say, God, I got some stuff that shouldn't be there. I've been carrying it from year to year. I I have great news for you. The Bible says if you confess your sins and forsake your sins, he's faithful and just and forgive you for your sins. And God will forgive you, and God will cleanse you, and and I'll tell you what, you don't have to drag those sins back into into 2019. You know what God wants us to be? God wants us to to, to be holy. You say, Joe, I have tried. Anyone here ever try and fail again? Anyone ever here say, God, I'm never going to do that again? And then like a week later, you're like, God, I'm never going to do that again. (laughs) And you go on and you think, man, is God sick of hearing me? The answer is no, God's not sick of hearing you. You say, Joe, I've tried to get over these sins and some things in my life. How how can I get over them? This is a good question. I'm here to tell you, you're not going to do it in your own strength. You can't even do it in your own power. The reason you have to strive to be holy, it's going to take the Holy Spirit in our lives. That brings me to our next point, is be filled. In chapter 5 and 
verse 18, it says this. And do not be drunk with wine, which is in dissipation, excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Do you know what God wants for all of us this year? To be filled with this Holy Spirit. When you got saved and you trusted Jesus as your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God came inside of you, and he made your body his home. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. So because he lives inside you, therefore glorify God in your body. So because the Holy Spirit lives inside you, what he's saying is then you need to live a holy life. Glorify God in the things that you do. And so your body is his home. My wife and I, we, we moved into a new home about a year ago. And when we moved into this new home, you, you know what we discovered? That the home needed some repairs. I needed to fix some bricks that had been falling apart in, in the chimney. And the wood on the back deck had rotted away, so we had to fix that. And they had some stuff in the garage that needed to go. And, and so we moved into this new home. We moved into this home, not new home. We moved into this home. We had to fix the deck. We had to paint the walls. We had to do all this work in the, in the home because we wanted the home to be a place where we could live comfortably. And I knew there had to be certain things done in this home for us to live in there. I wanted certain colors. I wanted the deck to be this. I want, it makes sense. And you do the same thing in your home, right? You bought your home. If you bought a home that was older, you went in there and you fixed it so that you could live in it in a comfortable way. Well, when the Holy Spirit came inside my body, my home, he looked around and went, this place is a mess. <laughs> I need to start cleaning some things up in Joe Ferreira. And he started replacing some of the broken things in my life. And when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came into your life, and you know what? He said the same thing. This place is a mess. <laughs> he began to do some painting and do some repairing and do some this and do some that. And he began to convict you of certain sins and things he wanted you to not to do and things he wanted you to, to do. And the Holy Spirit of God, you know, worked in your life in such a way to fix your life, to fix his home in a way that would be pleasing to him. And so when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he says, what I want for, for, for what God wants for us is I want us to be filled with the Spirit. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit of God lived inside you. Every single believer has the Holy Spirit of God. But not every believer is filled with the Spirit of God. You say, Joe, what, what's the difference? It, it's easy. When you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit. When you're filled, the Holy Spirit got you. Do you understand the difference between the two? You got saved, the Holy Spirit, you got him. But when, but when you got filled, that means the Holy Spirit now has you. And he's directing your life, and he's guiding your life, and he, he's doing those things and cleaning things out. You say, what's it really mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, our, our text tells us, don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. It seems like an odd way to teach about the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Hey, I'm going to teach you about the Holy Spirit. Well, how are you going to teach it? I'm going to use about drunkenness and wine. doesn't seem right. But doesn't drunkenness have an influence over people? You think about it for a second. If people are intoxicated, it affects the, way they, the words they speak. Oftentimes it's slurred. So if you're drunk, it affects the way you talk. If you're drunk, it affects the way that you walk. Anyone here have to do field sobriety tests? Kidding, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but one of the things they make you do during a field sobriety test, is, as I drive by and watch people, by the way, is they make them, you know, but they make them walk a straight line. And so if you're intoxicated, you really can't talk right. And if you're intoxicated, you really can't walk right. And if you're intoxicated, it affects your decision-making process. No one ever said, man, I got loaded last night and I made some great life choices at the bar. Said no one. And so alcohol affects your life. We have laws so that you're not under the influence because you can't make good decisions, you can't talk, you can't think straight. In the Bible, anyone who gets drunk, it always goes bad. Noah planted a vineyard. After the flood, he became drunk and he made a shame of himself. Lot's daughters got their father drunk, committed incest with them. Belshazzar had a drunken feast and he used the vessels taken from the temple of God. Christians at the church at Corinth came to the Lord's house for communion and they were drunk and many of them died. I can go through scripture after scripture after scripture. Why did they all do that? They made bad decisions when they were intoxicated. Why? Because alcohol affected them. Well, Christian, 
when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you are under his influence, he affects every area of your life too. He affects the way we talk. He affects the way we walk. And he affects the decisions that we make in this life. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, do you know all of a sudden you are, you are now become a bold witness? Because Jesus said, listen, you will be witness unto me and the Holy Spirit will give you power. And if you say, Joe, I'm not a good witness, then, then let me say this. If you're not a good witness and you're afraid to witness, man, maybe you're not filled with the Spirit because the power of the Holy Spirit supernaturally allows you to witness. Not to be afraid, not to be scared. Here you go, let me tell you about the Savior. The Holy Spirit of God helps our prayer life. The Bible says you don't even know how to pray except the Holy Spirit. And if your prayer life stinks and, and you don't really get to feel like you're talking to God, maybe you're not filled with the Spirit. Or the Holy Spirit, you know, he helps the decisions that we make. He helps us study our Bible. He's called the Word of Truth. And sometimes what happens as Christians is we keep these sins in our lives and we do things that aren't pleasing to God and we don't yield to the Holy Spirit and then we go, I wonder why I just don't feel like I'm really great with God right now. Maybe in 2018, maybe you did your own thing and went your own way. In May 2019, God is saying, you know what I want you to be? I want you to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. I want my spirit who moved into your house, into your body, to lead, guide, and direct you in this upcoming year. Be filled. And as you're filled with the Spirit, one thing the Holy Spirit does is this. He directs us away from sin and directs us to the things of God. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you've got sin in your life, and you've been trying to beat it by yourself, and forsake it by yourself, and conquer it by yourself, I got news for you. You failed. And when I tried to do it by myself, you know what happened? I failed. Because the Scripture says, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Not try harder so much, not make more decisions, not this, not that. But when the Holy Spirit of God has a hold of our lives, all of a sudden, man, we're wanting to live for him and to serve him. And he directs us from things that God says no. See, what happens is there's two things, two verses about the Holy Spirit. It says about why we don't walk and why we're not filled. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, we read, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So you can grieve him. It says in Thessalonians, And quench not the Spirit. So there's two things that we can do as Christians that keep us from being filled in the Spirit. One, it's we grieve him, and two, it's that we quench him. This is what I think they mean. When God, when the Holy Spirit tells us not to do something, it's a sin. And, and God speaks to your heart and goes, that's wrong, don't do it. And we do it anyways. We grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Just like as a parent, you ever tell your kids not to do something? Don't do that, don't do that, and they do it. How do you feel inside, besides angry? <laughs> kids didn't do it. It grieves you. So when God says don't, when the Holy Spirit says don't do it, and we do it, it grieves him. When the Holy Spirit tells us to do something, and we don't do it, we quench him. I want you to give to that missionary. I want you to go witness to that person. I want you to be reading your Bible. And we go, eh, nah. What we're doing is we're throwing a, a water on the fire of the Holy Spirit of God. And so be filled. Don't quench him. When he tells you to do something, do it. Don't grieve him when he tells you not to do something. Don't do it. Focus on that relationship with, with God and reading your Bible and prayer, and you'll find something, that the Holy Spirit of God will begin to guide and lead and direct your life. And as you walk in the Spirit, and as you're filled with the Spirit, you will accomplish more for God in 2019 than you did in 2018. Because God cares first about what's taking place on the inside. And as we are, get the inside right, Man, then all of a sudden, God can really begin to use us. Clean the inside of the cup first, and then the outside will take care of itself. So one, I think God wants us to be holy. Two, to do that, God wants us to be filled. Third thing on the list, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, God wants us to be kind. He says this in Ephesians, And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. You know, if mean, there's enough mean people to go around. Do we not all agree with that this morning? It doesn't take a spiritual gift to be mean. People are just naturally mean. What is seriously lacking in our society is kindness, tenderheartedness, which leads to forgiveness. And if there's one thing I wish we, I think, I think kindness is underrated, I think it's undervalued, and I think it's just underappreciated in our society. 
When Jesus, when, when, the, uh, when God says, let me tell you what love is, the first thing he said is love is patient. Do you know what number two on the list was? Love is kind. Here's the great thing about kindness. It costs you little to give it, but it means so much to the person who receives it. Kindness doesn't cost you anything most of the time. Because most times it's in words or it's in actions, and maybe sometimes it'll cost you a little bit financially. But no matter what it costs you, it costs you so little to be kind. It takes so little time. It takes so little effort. And yet it means so much to, 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 to people. And kindness can come in different ways. And I remember one of the kindest things that, that someone ever, ever said to me, and I want, I want to share it with you. But back in the day when I was younger and less mature, and I was still on staff, a pastor at a church, and I, I played in a church basketball league. And uh, as we were playing in a church basketball league, uh, there was this one guy who was covering me, and he kept elbowing me, like in the ribs, in the face, when he got rebounds. Anyone know, like you ever played basketball, and really fit, and we were, we were winning. And he kept elbowing me, and, and it started getting under my skin. You ever been in one of those situations where you can feel the old nature coming back up? You're like, oh, here it comes, man. I'm from Boston. I'm like, I felt that Boston stuff coming back up, man. Like I was on the park in Davis Square again, playing one-on-one -on -one basketball with someone. And, and so I went to the ref. You know, I'm a pastor. I've got to be Jesus. And, and so I went to the ref, and I said, hey, hey, listen, this guy keeps elbowing me. He keeps hitting me. And, and, it, and you listen, he's on me all the time. And the ref said, okay, okay, I'll watch for it. He didn't watch for it. He didn't call it again. And next time, the guy got a rebound, caught me right in the chin. And I did what the Bible says. The Bible says if, in Matthew chapter 18, if you have a problem with your brother, go and talk with that person. So I went with him and I said, listen, brother, if you do it again, I'm going to throw the ball off your face. <laughs> and we're going to go. Not a shiny moment. That's why I came out of the game, go back in, and... and Truth be told, I know someone's watching online who was from the game back then, too, and, they, and, he, and he elbowed me again. And I decided I'm a man of my word. <laughs> and so I threw the ball off his face, and I tackled him, and we began to fight in the middle of the court at that church basketball league. <laughs> and apparently, that's illegal. <laughs> it breaks some sort of rule. And I was kicked out of the game, and I was asked to take the rest of the season off. <laughs> and so I'm kicked out of the gym, because when you get kicked out of the game like that, you actually get kicked out of the gym. And so I'm sitting in my, my, my truck, and the whole church is, you know, a lot of people from the church would come to the games, and my team's in there, and, and the people in the church are in there, and all, you know, it's just, I'm like, what? I'm just like, so stupid. And you ever just, you ever do something stupid and you know it and you just start talking to yourself like, how can I be so stupid? How can I do this? This is embarrassing. Pass with the church and blah, blah, blah. And so the game was over. We won. And, and, and the people came out. And as they came out, I, I, I went to meet them because I figured, you know what? Let's just do this. And I walked up. There was, a, there was a couple. They were actually slightly younger than me, but they were a pretty prominent couple in our church and very spiritually minded. And as the people of our church came out, I said, listen, guys, I'm sorry for what happened. And this is what they said. We didn't see a thing. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. And they go, and I said, no, I'm sorry. Listen, I feel bad. They go, we don't know what you're talking about. And you know, not one time the rest of my life did they ever mention that event to me. They saw that I was broken up. They saw that I was hurt. See, see I thought they were going to be mean and cruel. How could you do this and all this? And, and, and maybe this isn't a great example, but to me, it was like one of the greatest, nicest acts of kindness and love and forgiveness. We don't even know what you're talking about. We went out to dinner. No one said anything, except one guy. He was like, he deserved it. <laughs> Him and I were good friends. <laughs> but I thought, not, not that we sweep sin under the rug, not that I was right, but sometimes a little kindness and forgiveness can go a long way. They may not even remember telling me this. This was, this was many years ago. And yet, to me, it was still one thing that affected my life where here's the chance they had to really... And you know what they were to me? Kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. 
you're going to have opportunities in 2019 to just yank at the people. You know what I think God wants us to be? Be kind. Be tenderhearted. Be forgiving. Not sweeps and under the rug, that's not what I mean. But to be gracious towards people. Be holy. Get some junk out of our lives that needs to go. Be filled. Start letting the Holy Spirit lead, guide, and direct us now. Be kind. And then be careful. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, the New American Standard, the NIV, and many versions word it like this. New King James says, you know, see that. It means be careful. Same, same Greek word, but he says this in New American Standard. It says, therefore, be careful how you walk. That's how you live. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days of evil. And so what God says in the book of Ephesians, not only do I want you to be holy, not only do I want you to be filled, not only do I want you to be kind, what I want you to do is I want you to be careful how you spend your time. Be careful how you spend 2019. I'm not sure. You ever wonder what your life would look like if they put all the time you spent on a pie chart? Like at the end of the year, God just sent you a pie chart and an email. And they said, this is what your life looks like. This is what you spent all your time doing. Like if a pie chart just happened to appear right behind me. Oh, here we go. So this is what it would look like. This is how many minutes you have in 2019. You have 526,000 minutes, roughly. That's how much time you have in 2019. If you work 40 hours a week, and you'll spend 124, almost 125,000 hours at work. So that takes a lot of our time. That's all right. The Bible says we're to be good workers and to provide, so no problem. If you sleep eight hours a day, some of you are thinking I'm way under that. Some of you are way over it, so this is just an average. If you sleep eight hours a day, you're going to sleep 175,200 minutes of 2019. If you jump on the computer for one hour a day and watching YouTube and some different videos, some of you way over, some of you way under, but if you do it one hour a day, you'll spend 21,900 minutes on your computer. If you watch an hour and a half of TV a day, Sunday some of us are over, or yesterday watching the football games, we probably blew past that. But an hour and a half a day, at the end of the year, you'll spend 32,400 minutes watching TV. If you jump on Facebook for about a half hour a day, checking, posting, doing this, you'll spend about 11,000 minutes on Facebook. If you have a hobby that takes you three hours a week, and that's not too bad, you know, you get out there, you play some sports, do some things, and you're going to spend 9,360 minutes on that. If you study your Bible and pray every single day for 365 days for 15 minutes a day, you'll spend about 5,475 minutes on Scripture. If you come, there's 52 weeks in a year. If you come to one service a week, like on a Sunday morning, you show up every Sunday morning, you never miss one Sunday morning service, and you only come to one a week, you'll spend about 3,000 hours in this place. Each of us has a limited amount of time. You see the big green part? It says extra. Anyone feel like they have extra? I don't feel like I have extra. Extra can be driving to work. Extra can be eating. Extra can be spending time with family. And, and extra, you can fill it in however you want. But this is why I, I discovered it in my short time on this earth. You cannot make time. You cannot buy time. You cannot save time. There's only one thing you can do with time. You know what it is? Spend it. And each of us has 526,000 minutes to spend in 2019. And you get to choose how you do it. And God says, what I want you to do, though, is as you do it, I want you to be careful. I want you to be wise. I'm not here to crack on anyone. I'm, I, there were things in my life I had to priori prioritize. After I made this chart, I was going to do it off my life, and I thought, no. <laughs> because I had to adjust some things. You know what the truth is? That some of us are going to get to the end of the year and you're going to spend more time in Facebook than in God's book. That's the truth. Nothing wrong with that. You can do nothing wrong with Facebook. I'm on there. And just how do you want to spend it? Some of you don't come to, you know, the truth is, you know, some spend more time in the outhouse than God's house if we add up all the minutes throughout the year. That's the truth. That's just the truth. I don't want to get to heaven and God's like, you spend, you know, six years of your life in the outhouse and only one year in God's house. I don't want that. 
And so maybe, you know, you look at your life and God says, I want you to be careful. So maybe it's, it's, you examine your life and you say, you know what, maybe I need to be in God's house more. Maybe 3,000 minutes a year is not enough for me to live the life that he's called me to live. Maybe 3,000 minutes isn't enough for my kids to, to, to get grounded into the things of God. Maybe I need to come back tonight. Maybe I need to come out Sunday. Listen, this ain't about a guilt trip. Listen, it's your life. It's your time. It's your chart. You can do whatever you want with it. The only thing I can tell you to be is what God says. Be careful. Be wise. I'm for having fun. I like hobbies. I enjoy all those things. But I just think it's good to prioritize what does God want from me and what's going to bring the most out of my life. Fun and enjoyment, that's all in my pie chart, man. But I've just decided to be careful and to be wise how I spend my time in 2019. Finally, I'll give you one last one. What does God want us to be in 2019? He wants us to be strong. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10 and 11, we read this section of scripture. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 2019 may not be an easy year. And I can guarantee there will be storms, trials, and difficulties that we're all going to face. There are going to be some hard times. And if you're here this morning and you decide this, you decide, God, I want to be holy in 2019. I got to get some stuff out of my life. I want to be filled and allow the Holy Spirit of God to direct and lead me. I want to be kind out there, being kind to people, loving and forgiving. I want to be careful and start to use my time more on the things of God. I can, I can attest to this, that if you decide that you're going to be holy and you're going to be filled and you're going to be kind and you're going to be careful, then you will come under attack. Because Satan will not sit back and just allow you to go ahead and start living for God. He's perfectly happy with you being nothing for God. But if you say, I want to be something in 2019, and you decide, I'm going to be holy, I'm going to be all those things, then don't forget the last one. You better be ready and be strong. Because it is his desire, Satan's desire, not to have you be anything in 2019. To be nothing for God. To be nothing for his kingdom to witness to no one, to not be in his house, to not read his word, to not spend time with him, all of those things he wants you to be. And if you decide, no, this is the year, it's time for me to get real about my faith and get real about my walk with God, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Because you will be attacked. You will come under a battle. The Bible says in that same section of Scripture, we don't wrestle, wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, Against things in dark places, Satan and his demons would have nothing more than to have you live contrary to God and his word. And if you have purpose in your heart this morning, if God's been speaking to you, hey, there's some things that, that I need to change in my life, be strong. Don't just let it be a one-time decision you made on this Sunday morning. Be strong throughout this upcoming year in his, in his might and in his power because you won't be able to make it on your own. You need the power of the Lord in your life. Anytime we try to do it in our own strength, we always fail. There's some things I, I want to do so much. I want to be so much better in 2019. It's not that I was horrible in 2018, but I looked at my life and I go, you know what, God? Help me to be more like you, more like your son. And I'm ready. I'm trying to be strong, trust in God and rely in him. And so what does God want us to be in 2019? Well, according to the book of Ephesians, he wants us to be holy, he wants us to be filled, he wants us to be kind, he wants us to be careful, and he wants us to be strong. And I think if we could do those five things, that we would accomplish a lot for God and his kingdom in this upcoming year. Don't you agree? If we focused a little bit on what God wants us to be, then I can't imagine what God will want us to do. I want to leave you with one more. It's not in your bulletin. If you're here this morning, you say, that's a nice list, Joe, and great. But you know what? I don't know Jesus. I don't know who in this book of Ephesians is written to. And you're here this morning, and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. I want to give you one more B. And that God would have you to be saved. The Bible says that God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
if you confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And if there's one decision that you can make this morning that will change your life and your eternal life, above all the other things that I listed, the one thing that God would have for all of us, I know this, is he would have you to be saved. You say, what does this mean to be saved? It's simple. It's to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. To believe that Jesus came, born of a virgin, lived a perfect sinless life. He died on a cross for my sins and yours. They buried him in a tomb, and three days later he rose again from the grave. And if you call upon him, he will save you. And he will change your life here on earth. And he will change where you spend eternity. The best decision I ever made was the day I trusted Christ as my Savior. So you know what God wants you to be first and foremost? He wants you to be saved. I'm going to ask Nick to come at this time, and we're going to have a, a song of invitation. And what this just means is this, is we're going to give you a chance, an opportunity, that if God has spoken to your heart to come, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, and you know you've been waiting and you've been putting it off year after year, and you know, listen, this is, this is the time, the Bible says, of salvation. You know God's talking to you this morning. I want you to step out. Don't care if you're in the middle or in the balcony. I want you to step out where you're at. I want you to come forward. And we're going to take the Bible and show you how to be saved to make sure you understand what Christ did for you. Can you be saved where you sit? Of course you can. You can call upon the name of the Lord wherever, you, wherever you're at. But we desire to make sure you understand the scriptures. And if God's spoken to your heart, I want you to come. If the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning about something you need to change in 2019, something that he wants you to be, holy, careful, filled, kind, strong, or maybe something I didn't even listen, list. That's okay. If you want to come in at the altar and say, God, you've laid some things upon my heart, and I just want to be all you, you would have for me in 2019, I want you to know the altar's open. The Lord has spoken to your heart about following him in bapti baptism. Maybe that's the first step of obedience. They were saved in the early church and they were baptized. Maybe 2019 is the year you, you follow the Lord in baptism. Maybe God's been speaking to your heart about joining Baptist Temple. We look for people to join, not so we could say, oh, we got two more members on a roll. Don't care about that. We look for people to join to become part of this local church, to use their gifts and abilities to serve Jesus Christ. That's, what, that's who we're looking to join and be part of. You say, I don't have many gifts or abilities. That's okay. You don't need a lot. God will take whatever you have and he'll use it. If he has spoken to your heart about salvation, would you come? If he's spoken to your heart about what to be in 2019, would you come? I want you to know as I, I wrote this sermon, I, I didn't come to the altar here, but it was in my office. And I just bowed down on my chair and just say, you know what, Lord? So many things I need to be in 2019. And I want to do it through your strength and your power. If you've spoken to your heart, come. Salvation, the altar's open, or church membership, baptism. I ask you to stand at this time. And if God has spoken to your heart, please come. Please come. Draw me close to you. A new year, Never let fresh start, me go. new challenges, new opportunities. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. Maybe you've been struggling in your marriage and you just want to come and pray for 2019. Altar's open. Take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. God speaks to your heart. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. You would have all men to be saved. You're all I want, and you're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. 
draw me close to you. And never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire, and no one else will do. It's not too late to come if God's been speaking to your heart. Because nothing else can take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. So help me find the way. Bring me back to you. here this morning, and you don't know Christ, and you just couldn't come forward for whatever reason, don't leave this morning without knowing him as Savior. Come and talk to me or one of the other staff members. We'd love to make sure you understand the way of salvation that's found in Christ. Tonight at six o'clock, I'm beginning a new series. Appreciated Pastor Steve as he did Meaning Through Moses for several months, and I'm going to be bringing a new series uh, through a book study through the book of First Timothy. If you've never studied a book of the Bible before, I'd like to encourage you just to come back out, to try. We're going to study it verse by verse as we go all the way through, and I guarantee you're going to learn about the book of 1 Timothy, you're going to learn about Paul, about Jesus, and you're going to learn some things about yourself too. And that's tonight at, at, at 6 o'clock. And let us be a prayerful people and strive to be that all God wants us to be in 2019 as a people and as a church. And I believe this, that as we strive to be what God wants us to be, that God will use us in great and mighty ways, and God will show us the things that he needs us to do. And so let's, 2019, let's just start with, God, what do you want me to be? And then show me what you want us to do. And let's see God work and do some amazing things in this upcoming year. I'm going to ask Pastor Steve to come and to close us in a word of prayer. God, we're just thankful for a good day in your house, and God, we just, we all desire to have a good year. We want 2019 to be good and prosperous for us. God, may we understand and grasp this thought that in order to have a good and prosperous 2019, it's got to begin with being what you would desire us to be.